Mozilla Tamil Nadu is a group of volunteers who are passionate about Mozilla related technologies and various open source projects. They work with a goal of spreading technology to all the extents. And FOSSWEETS is an initiative by this community to boost FOSS contribution in the present period. In this webinar series, we invite subject matter experts and long time contributors from Mozilla and various other FOSS organizations to kickstart your journey in open source. So far, we have successfully conducted three webinars on different projects like Common Voice, Wikipedia, and Wiki Commons. The recording of these are available on our YouTube channel if you have missed to attend our. This is the fourth webinar, which is about how JS works inside modern web browsers. And we are happy to announce that this webinar is in collaboration with Facebook Developer Circle. Facebook Developer Circle is a free nonprofit developer community that is directly supported by Facebook for learning and collaborating with other developers. It is a channel to learn about developer tools and Facebook products. They work with a mission to create active communities for any developer around the world to access information, share knowledge, and collaborate with other developers and communities led by local community experts who are passionate about giving back. Moving to the presenter of the day. So today, Amritsas, we have the lead of Facebook Developers Circle Chennai as a presenter for the day. He has organized 50 plus events for both students and professionals over the last few years. He has worked in a lot of startups and SMEs and has about 10 years of experience as a software engineer. He has worked with consulting and product based companies in the past where he has developed applications as a lead developer and deployed them to different cloud infrastructures. So as like you, even I'm excited about the day and the event. Without any further delay, I will rush up to certain guidelines to be followed during the webinar. First, please to answer the polls that are shown during the event. This is only to measure the outreach about the event. Secondly, the session will last nearly for one and a half hours. It will start in minutes from now. So it will last only for one and a half hours and we'll have a QA session after that. So as you all know, this is a recorded session and we will share the recording. We encourage you to post your queries in the QA tab. On the left side of your screen, you will be able to see the QA tab. So please do post your queries in the QA tab. The queries will be answered by the speaker after his session or towards the end of his session. So in case, if you feel like you need to voice out your question or you want to ask it in the uh, webinar directly, you can use the option of raising hand. So if we found that your hand is raised and if you drop a message please do drop a message to us in the QA tab stating you want to speak we will give you a chance we will allow you to speak towards the end of the session but we encourage you to post your questions in QA tab that will be easy for the recordings if there is no other way you can raise your hand we will give you a chance to speak towards the end of the session so please don't forget if you raise your hand as well as drop us a message alone we will be giving you a chance to speak towards the end of the session as it is a recorded session. Finally, uh, regarding the recording, so we will be releasing this recording, the entire uh, recorded uh, webinar in our official Mozilla Tamil Nadu's official channel, Mozilla TN YouTube channel, and also in uh, Facebook Developer Circle Chennai's official page by Sunday evening. So with this, I would like to hand over the uh, and all the webinar to Mr. Magesh. So Mahesh, please do take over. Sure, Ashley. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, let me just share my screen and I before I start talking. All right, so guys. Um, you know, today we're going to talk about JavaScript. Um, I I want to like first see. Um, there are some comments. Okay, yeah. I will also be looking at the uh, Q and A box. You know, if you have any questions, you can drop it as I'm talking, so I can answer you. 
right? But before we start, I would like to know, you know, how many of you are students and how many of you are professional? You know, if you are students, uh, just write, write this keyword, you know, saying student. That's all. Just put, say, uh, just type student in the QA box. That's it. Right? And if you are a um, professional, just type professional. Okay? And then if you are already working with um, JavaScript frameworks like Angular or ReactJS or something like that, you know, you can type that also. Just type uh, ReactJS or Angular or whatever you're working with. So I would know, you know, the kind of audience that I have right now. So I can plan this uh, discussion in a way that it's helpful for people. Yes. Right. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah. I can see now. Mm. Awesome. Cool, cool. Mm. OK, so I can see a lot of students and also professionals. I think it's a mixed crowd. People working on React.js, AngularJS, yes. Wow, this is good. Mm. OK. Yeah, there are a lot of people who are working with React.js and AngularJS. OK. Mm. Awesome. Before I start talking, I'll tell you why you know we plan this thing. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of training in terms of, uh, I mean, training with React.js and AngularJS mostly. I mean, sorry, I, React is my main thing. I'm working on a lot of frameworks like this so far. So when I talk about React.js, when I do a session on React.js and tell people how you can build an application using these frameworks, uh, a lot of the times I see people having trouble with the JavaScript than the uh, framework itself, right? So which is why we thought, you know, it's, it will make sense for me to just start, um, you know, telling you about JavaScript before I go into React.js. So that is why I thought, you know, we can start with a JavaScript session where we will talking we'll be talking about the fundamentals that you might not know otherwise. You know, if you're just writing code every day, you might not you know know about a lot of these fundamentals on how these browsers work, right? So which is why um, we are doing this session today. Um, some of you might have already come across these uh, topics or maybe these uh, things that we are talking about. In case if you have seen this already, just you know hold on for some time. There might be something that you didn't know. Or you, if you want to add something to something that I'm already talking about, you can feel free to add it, right? All right, cool. So there are like students, professionals, uh, freelancers. Awesome. Mm, perfect. OK, guys, cool. So now, moving on. Right, she has already, Ashley has given a good introduction for me. So I'm Magesh, and I work for Sedin Technology as a consultant. And I focus more on you know training people, uh, upskilling people by teaching them a lot uh, technologies like Ruby on Rails and then uh, JavaScript, Node.js, React, etc. Right. So I'll skip this. Open source tools in the past. You know, I was a Ruby on Rails developer for a very long time, and then I um, you know moved on from Ruby on Rails to JavaScript stack, and I started working with React mostly and lesser. Uh, server-side programming and using Rails. And then I also work with these other open source tools like you know, MySQL, PostgreSQL, MongoDB, CouchDB, and et cetera. Okay. So, so what I did was, right now, I'm working for Sedin Technologies as a uh, consultant dev coach. But previously, you know, a year back, I was running my own startup. Uh, I was running the startup for almost six years. And uh, I used to be a software consultant. So that is where my experience comes from, you know, how I um, you know, started working with these open source tools and how I started working with web development. And we have built so many products for different customers from around the world. Right? Most, of our, most of these customers were from India and like few from US and uh, Europe. So that is how it was. Right? So that's a little about me. And now uh, let's look at the agenda. Uh, what I'm going to do is let me share that. Okay, so, so as you saw in the poster, so we'll be talking about JavaScript, you know, just to understand, you know, what um, what was JavaScript initially designed for, and then how things change and how we are using JavaScript in this latest world right now. And you know, let's talk a little bit about ECMAScript, uh, what is JavaScript engines. You might have heard of these things, but do you really understand these things? That is the question I'm putting forward to you. And we will talk about that um, in detail. And we will also be talking about the JavaScript runtime uh, and the content that it has, like you know, the call stack, memory heap, and uh, you know, issues like Stack Overflow, memory leaks, and then we'll also talk about interpreters and compilers. You might have studied this back in college, but 
um, you know, you might not have uh, gone about it after that, right? So we'll talk a little bit about the interpreters and compilers, and there's a connection to JavaScript also. So we'll talk about uh, that as well, right? Cool. So now, okay. So I'm new to this Zoho tool. I'm just figuring it out. Anyways, yeah, sharing my presentation again. Cool. Right. So this is a presentation that I created for a full day course. But right now, this is not, you know, webinars are like limited. I used to do a lot of offline training. So this is the presentation that I have. But today, what I'll do is I'll just limit this to like one hour or maybe one and a half hour. And if you if you find it interesting, like you can ask questions and we'll see how we can take it forward. But otherwise, I will limit it to like maximum of 1.5 hours, right? So I will go on until 1.5 and we'll stop there. And if you want you know, to learn more things, we can probably have a part two session sometime later next week or after that, right? So that is how it's going to be. So what is JavaScript, right? So people might know that JavaScript, you know, some might say that JavaScript is a scripting language and some might say it's a programming language. So it's like a, uh, it's like a thing programming. Um, so what, what, how, um, like why did you use JavaScript for? Right. And what is the main purpose of using JavaScript? Usually, you know, what I do is every time when I talk about a programming language or a particular framework, the first question that I ask is why? Why do I need this tool? You know, if you're talking about React.js or AngularJS, why do we have to learn React.js or why do we have to use, um, you know, AngularJS? That should be the question that you ask yourself. You know, you should not just jump on something just because somebody else is using it. Just because everybody else is using JavaScript, I don't want to jump onto JavaScript. Instead, I need to find the purpose, the reason why this can add value to me and my company, right? So I need to figure out what exactly I'm doing here. So I, if you're working with these front-end frameworks, you should know why you're using it, right? So a little bit of history, we'll be going back. That's small good information to know, you know, back in the 1995, uh, this is how JavaScript started, right? A contractor at Netscape called Brandon A, he created the JavaScript language. And the fun fact is, you know, he built this in like 10 days. This was mainly used for running it on web browsers, right? So he needed a programming language that wanted to be uh, like the, he wanted to run that on the browsers. That was his main thing, right? And it was created in just 10 days as the story goes. So after that, what happened was, we were using this, um, like developers back then, they were using this only for a very limited uh, use case. Like for example, um, you might have been using it for creating a form validation, like front end validation. Uh, where you have a form in your HTML page or you know PHP or whatever they were using long time back, you will have some JavaScript functions that is going to just validate this form in real time. Like when I type something, I can see some red color thing. You know, hey, you're, you're not supposed to you know type something else in the email box. Email has to be in this format. So these kind of simple uh, form validation was what we were using it for. So if you talk about JavaScript back then, it was not a cool thing. Right? right now, JavaScript has become a cool thing. And you know, when I say I'm a JavaScript developer or a JavaScript coach, that sounds really cool. But back then, it was like really lame. When I say I'm a JavaScript developer, they'll be like, oh, what? Uh, because people think that JavaScript developers were like restricted to only doing certain things like you know, uh, writing some validations and uh, you know, working with these small, small stuff. Right? So because other people were more respected back then. You know, front end is, was not like a great deal back then. We had PHP and we had uh, other softwares, you know, Java and all, which is used for backend stuff. Web page was like totally different back then. Web page used to be uh, more of a static than dynamic. You know, these days, what we see on the web is like more dynamic, right? It's everything is like quickly changing. And uh, so hold on. Okay. Mm. Right. So these days we have a lot of dynamic things happening in the website. So that is why we want, we have moved on from, you know, simple, uh, static website to a dynamic website by using AngularJS or ReactJS or Vue and etc. Right. So, so here, so JavaScript was initially intended to enable animations and other manipulations on the browser. Animations were also very minimal back then, not many uh, like you see today. Right. In those days, it was very very simple stuff that you used to do um, on you know making your application more interactive for the customer. We skip this part. Another fun fun. I'm starting with some little bit of fun fact, and before we dive deep into you know what all these things are, another fun fact is you know when people you know when you say that I'm working with JavaScript, immediately another person might ask you, right? Uh, are you is it Java? Is it like related to Java? Or is it the same as Java? So people back in those days they used this name JavaScript and Java. I mean Java and JavaScript to you know kind of get a marketing 
trick actually to create a marketing trick so people java was very popular back then so they needed a name like this so people will jump onto javascript and explore it so that is a small trick they used back then but it doesn't have any relation to java you know when you look at javascript the syntax is completely different from what you see with java okay you just skip these parts um all right so when you know initially when we started off with uh, writing javascript back then it was like very very slow so in 1995 or in probably you know early early days of the 2000 people kind of uh, thought the javascript is not good for you know running a lot of programming stuff on the browser because the way it was working was very very slow and the people kind of dismissed it saying you know it's like not it's useless some people even said that javascript is useless and they just put it off so that is the reason why it was being used only for minimal cases in a website it, that was just used in one page for just doing validation that's like one or two pages probably that was how it was being used back then but then after that a lot of research started where, you know recently uh, like we are looking at chrome which has uh, this v8 javascript engine which is like the most advanced form of it right so they uh, these kind of researches started um, at around that time and uh, now they say that you know these things these tools kind of outperform c++ code and also python right now so i didn't know about these things like i did some research on how javascript works and i came to this fact you know that says that it kind of outperforms c++ code and also python in some cases right so which is how amazing javascript has become you know after all these years so now when you talk about javascript people might also be talking about ecmascript right so some people will say hey i'm working with uh, javascript and some might someone might say es6 es7 like that right i'm working with es6 um, javascript es6 so what is this es right es stands for ecmascript that is what they mean when they say es6 or es7 so the standard version that we were using back in 2000 right were, that was like es5 2010 around that time I, i was using probably es5 we were not you know um, using a lot of uh, you know you were not writing a lot of front end stuff back then so i was just simply writing uh, es5 but now after that we got es6 es7 and i'll be showing you about those things also so what is ecmascript actually i think i'll i'd like to make this little interactive is my voice echoing folks i think someone is saying that my voice is echoing can you give me a confirmation is it clear if it's clear just type clear is there any problem if you have any problem just uh, let me know ah cool cool okay a lot of people are saying it's very clear okay good good thanks guys mm. awesome cool right so so there's a bit of confusion here you know when we talk about javascript and then some people say it as ecmascript so i'll i'll you know make this very clear to you right javascript last name programming language name but ecmascript is the standard actually you know every scripting language uh, you know that are designed can use or can be based on a standard right so in this case javascript is a scripting language that is following some of the standards defined by ecmascript Right, ECMAScript is nothing but a standard. Okay, there is a committee. There is a committee called, you know, ECMA International. Uh, so these people, there are like a bunch of people who sit and decide what are the rules that are supposed to be going inside the ECMAScript. Like how the ECMAScript should work. What are the things that the script can do? What are the things a script can cannot do? And how this this thing should work? You know, everything. All these standards are set by this particular uh, team that we see here. Right. I should highlight. Yeah. Right. So this team. they are working on this uh, there are like people who have debates on you know how we can improve these things so that is how they create uh, you know new versions every year so when when somebody says ecmascript they are just referring to the standards on which you know the javascript is based on right so javascript actually follows this ecmascript standard created by this committee and there are also other languages that are following the similar thing like for example there's action script some some of you might have heard of action script and there's j script so all these things are based on it even even i can go about and create my own programming language or a scripting language following this thing you know uh, ecmascript ecmascript standard or i can create my own and you know i can set my own rules this is just to make sure that you know if somebody is following these standards then it means that this particular uh, language programming language will work very efficient because this been this work has been going on for a very long time right so these people have understood what are the issues that happens and how to you know eliminate these memory problems and all that thing right so they have created this standard referring to all these problems that they have faced over the decade right 
So if I'm going to create a new language, it makes more sense for me to just follow some standard like this instead of just you know saying, hey, I will create my own programming language. I will just give it my own name. I, it won't have function. It'll have something else. So that's like a very revolutionary way of doing things. And I don't know what will happen and what will fail, right? So it's like an experiment. So instead of doing, instead of trying an experiment, a random experiment like that, it is better for me if I follow a certain standard that already works, right? If this standard has been working well for a very long time. So that which is why you know JavaScript follows these uh, standards, and every year they keep on introducing new things into the ECMA standard, and JavaScript will adopt. So all these browsers, Chrome, Firefox, uh, IE, and etc. Right. So these people they will have to look into these things and see you know what what are the features that I want to support and what are these features that I don't want to support from the standard, right? So I hope you understand what ECMAScript standard actually means, right? And you, you, there's a difference between ECMAScript standard and the committee that is behind this standard. You know, these people are putting out the standard and saying these are the rules. This is how you should the programming language should look. I mean, uh, this should how it. This is how it should work. And these are the things that you should do when you are creating a new programming language like this, right? So if you look at this, there's a, like a lot of versions that you might already heard of. You know, there's ES6, ES7, 8, 9, 10, and all that. So uh, you might see this as a version like ES6. People might be referring it to ES6, or some might just say ES2015 or ECMAScript 2015, right? So we are saying this as ES2015 because it was released in June 2015, right? That because that that is the year in which this particular release uh, release came out. So they are just referring to this version. So you can call it ES2015 or ES6, right? So if you want to just remember, you can just say, you know, like uh, I can simply say, this is what I would follow. I would say ES6, ES7, 8, 9, etc. I would not use the year. But if somebody asks, hey, what is this ES6? Uh, you know, when was this released? I can easily compute from this last digit, you know, 6 is minus 1, 5. So 2015, I would just remember from that. So that is how I would say. Right? If somebody asks me as this as a question saying, you know, when was this release? I can simply minus 1 year and say 2016. Here, minus 1 will be like 2017. Right? It's easier for me to remember. Just to make that connection. Initially, you know, people getting started with JavaScript might get confused with these terms. You know, hey, what is this when people are talking about uh, JavaScript, ECMAScript, ES6, what is this? ES2015, I don't know. So this slide would make you, uh, you know, make things clear for you, I hope. All right, so now why JavaScript? Right? There are so many programming languages in this world. You know, people are going crazy these days. You know, even just a few days back, somebody was asking me this question. There's like Python, there's Java, there's C++, there's so many things going on. There's new language coming up, Go language, Rust, R, and whatnot, right? So they were asking like, how do I go and pick the right language and how do I decide what to do? So that has become a thing. So what you should do is you should probably understand why uh, you know these languages exist and what are the kind of problems that these languages solve and only when you understand that, you will know, like, OK, fine, this is my problem. I want to build a web application right now. And to build a web application, probably, you know, I should look at these languages. You know, these are the only languages that help me build the application, right? So like, for example, if you use um, R, you, R is not used for building a web application right now. If you look at web application, most of these popular things are like Java, Python, Ruby, and et cetera, right? Um, so that is how it is. So it is based on use case. So you figure out what is your use case, what is the problem that you are trying to solve, right? And then you find out what are the languages that supports this particular use case. And then you go and check out the syntax, the documentation, and figure out which, uh, what are the programming languages that interest you, like that you find it amazing, right? And then you decide, okay, fine, let's go with this one. There are like three options for me right now, uh, Ruby, Python, Java, like, but I think you know I like the syntax that Ruby has, or maybe I like the syntax that Python has, so I'll just go with this. So that is how I decide on uh, moving on with the right language. So when talking about JavaScript, why JavaScript? So first thing is building a dynamic and interactive UI for web, right? Long time back, what happened was, like I told you, we were only building static websites. You know, this, there's just static website. Does, it didn't have any animations in it or no images, not, nothing. Like, even the images were so boring and dull back then, right? But nowadays, when you look at a, a new website from a big company like Facebook or Google, what happens is, you know, they have so much of interaction happening uh, within the screen, right? So when you scroll, there's like a balloon going from bottom to up, and then something dropping from the sky and all that, right? So there's like really cool stuff that are being done in the website. In in these days, if you build a website and if you don't have these interactions, then you're probably old school. You know, people will say, you know, hey, dude, this is boring. These guys are like old school. That is how it is. So this is the reason why people thought, okay, how do I create my application in a way that it is more interactive and fun for people who are coming in? Right. So end of the day, it's all business. So people 
you build website because you want your customers to use your product regularly so how will i make it uh, you know how will my customer use it regularly i have to you know go with the latest trend and i have to make sure that it's like dynamic and creative and whatever that uh, you know user wants he wants speed, speed actually because of speed we are moving on to frameworks like angular js react js and vue js because we want the page to navigate you know in a fast manner when you click a button there's immediately another page rendering so the render should not take time like it used to happen long time back where you click on a link and then it's like loading for some time and then another page comes in and then you click on another link takes some time to load it so this is not happening now you, you don't see this any happening any day right there are still few websites which are on that level right now but not uh, you know that is not the most uh, case right mostly people will go for a very interactive website using these front end frameworks right so first thing is i can use javascript to build a very dynamic and interactive ui uh, for my application for my product second thing is uh, not just front end i can also use javascript you know to in the back end to you know access the database to access the file system and you know deploy something so node node js you know is going to give you this power to create a back end application now like i said long time back javascript was only used on the front end but not anymore now javascript has become universal meaning it can be used for a variety of things right website and then node js is going to help you create the back end right so front end back end is covered next is you know there's something called as react native where you know you use the same language javascript to build like really cool mobile applications right you can build mobile applications for android ios and etc even i think uh, windows is also going to be added to react native so you can build three build for three platform if you know react native and javascript right windows ios android isn't that cool and then there's another uh, library called electron another tool called electron which you can just use to build desktop application right so these are the different things that you can build if you just know this one language javascript if you're like really strong and really cool with javascript you can just go on and build a web application or a desktop application or a mobile app anything is possible with just one language which is not the case with these other uh, you know languages right like for example if you know java you can write applic web mobile applications for android but you can't use java to write mobile application for other platform you can use java for website also but still there's still a lot of things missing in it right so like that this is the reason why people are all flocking towards javascript you know in the recent uh, few years because with javascript there's multiple options for me i can do so many things right and it's very helpful when i train my people i can just train them in javascript and make them work on any of these platforms right for a company that is how it would works okay now let's get back into the basics okay this is why you all are waiting to learn right so basics we'll go to the deep down basic stuff that you need to know so when i say you know this is a javascript code that i use uh, console.log hello people right so um, when i Type something like this it's going to print hello people but how does this computer read this actually right so how do i tell the computer to do something which is what we try to do with programming so let's say i want to have this image uh, you know displayed on my computer how do i tell this computer that you know hey i want this image to be displayed i cannot talk like i'm doing right now you know i cannot talk in english because the computer doesn't understand right hey computer show me spider-man's picture it's not going to work right the computer is going to be like what you're going to say you know can you just you know do that in machine language because the computer doesn't understand any of the other language except for this machine language right so you will have to write things in machine language for the application to work right so that is where you know this high level programming language came in you might have studied this in college i'm just brushing up your uh, basic stuff right so java c++ javascript all these languages are like high level languages coming back to this you know javascript is also like one of these high level programming languages why are we using this high level programming language because that is how i interact with the computer i have to otherwise go and talk to the computer in machine language directly which i don't like i don't like to write you know zeros and ones to uh, talk to the computer that's not cool so i have to probably uh, figure out a better way to do it that's how people ended up creating coding languages like java c++ and javascript right so what happens is as a human you know look at this flow chart this is a little boring flow chart but anyways you know bear with me so as a human i have to write my code in java or c or go language whatever it is this is the high level language like a translator right so then it is being sent to a compiler this compiler or an interpreter in some cases you know compiler or interpreter will convert this back to machine language and the computer knows now okay oh this guy is telling asking me to render a picture spider man's picture right the computer is able to understand without this it's not going to happen right 
I am not willing to write machine language, and the computer is not willing to learn English, right? So it's not going to happen either way. Which is why we are using these lang programming languages, right? So now, what about JavaScript? Here's the question: um, JavaScript is it interpreted or compiler? Okay, for this, I want you guys to answer: Is it interpreted or compiled? Can you just put it down in my message box, the chat box, or whatever you call it, the QA box? Is it inter how many of you think it is interpreted and how many of you think? Just type interpreted if you think interpreted or if you think it's compiled. Give me the answer. Is JavaScript compiled or interpreted? Let's see what people think. Interpreted, interpreted, compiled, interpreted. Oh, interpreted only. Mm -hmm. OK, cool. OK, someone says both interpreted and compiled. Mm. Yes, cool, interpreted. Yes, 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 correct. Cool. So people say, uh, I can I can see that, you know, people, a lot of them are saying that it's interpreted. It's like, it's not exactly true, but you are you're not wrong also, because, you know, going by the textbook definition, you would see that JavaScript is interpreted, right? Because that is how it started. When uh, JavaScript was first done, uh, oh, people are still <laughs> giving you an answer. Oh, I like this enthusiasm. You know, people are going and giving me a lot of answers. Cool. So when JavaScript started initially, it was not like this, okay, not what we see right now. So back then, it was only an interpreted language. So when, if you said interpreted, then it makes sense because JavaScript was only interpreted. But now it is both actually interpreted and compiled. We saw in the few, I mean, uh, the previous slides, right? I was telling you that JavaScript was considered useless by some of these developers back in the you know 90s because it was interpreted and was damn slow. It was really, really slow. So people didn't like it, right? So that is when it was only interpreted. Then they came up with some idea to make it more faster, which is by combining these two ideas, interpretation and the compiling, right? We'll talk about that in detail a little bit. So that is how it is. So for the answer to that question is, you know, is it compile or interpret? Then it's probably both, okay? So I'll explain to you, you know, let's talk a little bit about the interpreter and the compiler, okay? So, right? Let me check answers. Yes. Yeah, yeah. People have all, like some of you have given the right answers. Yeah, people are talking about V8 and Chrome V8, etc. Yes, we will come to that a little later. But just look at this function, you know, for now, right? Uh, so what happens is, well, I'll tell you what I have defined here. So I'm just creating an add function, which will take two arguments, X and Y, and then it will return the sum of it. Just adding these two and giving me the answer. That's it. It's a pretty simple function, right? So now then what I do is I'm going to put this, I'm calling this function inside a for loop, you know, for i is equal to this thing and thousand times. I'm going to run this for loop thousand times and uh, thousand times this particular function is going to be called, right? So what happens with an interpreter and a compile? Just, you know, take the time to think about, uh, you know, interpreted and compile to see how this particular uh, program will work, right? So interpreter, when you talk about interpreted, what does interpretation mean? You know, interpretation is like, Executing things line by line, meaning um, the computer reads a particular a set of uh, instruction and then it executes it immediately. Let's say, you know, in this case, the line, first line it reads and then it executes, second line it reads and then it, it's going to execute, it's like that. It, it does not like line by line, but you know, it, once it can understand something, it will just execute it. Like first line, if it says, if it's incomplete, you know, just the function add and this uh, bracket, it is not complete, right? This is not complete. So it's going to read the, this thing also. So once, once it's able to make a understanding of these three lines, then it's going to ex execute it, right? So that is how interpretation work. Interpretation will get executed immediately, right? So that is how this works. And compile is not going to work like this. I'll tell you the problem, uh, why JavaScript team didn't want uh, this particular thing to just be an interpreted language. Because if this was interpreted language, like I told you, it's going to execute line by line, right? So what happens here is when I have this particular function in for loop for thousand time, this is going to be read again and again. Okay, this particular function is going to be called again and again thousand different times, right? So for all these thousand different times, the answer is going to be the same, right? Because I'm passing five comma four. So five comma four is just nine always, in no matter how many times I do. So but this interpreter does not is does not have this intelligence to know that this function is just passing the same value again and again, and uh, it is going to just execute it each and every time. So what happens with an interpreter? This is going to be called thousand times, right? So it's going to compute five plus four, five plus four, five plus four. You know, I don't know what it does to compute. Maybe it's like you know five in the nine, four in the nine, whatever it is. So it is going to compute like this for thousand times, which is a use, like it's just useless, right? It's a, 
it's, it's not the right way to do it you know because once i know that this input is not changing i could probably cache this and you know just say just execute 9 give the result as 9 for all the 1000 times maybe one time i can compute and get the value and for the rest of the time i don't have to compute i just simply look at this value and say oh no it's just the same answer same answer for other times right so that is how it should be but interpreter does not work in such way right that is the problem they first saw they figured out that this is the reason why javascript is slow right no now how why why did they decide to make this an interpreted language before is because there's a reason right how does the compiled language work for compiled language to work what happens is you need to write the entire programming right you need to finish writing the entire uh, coding and then you feed that file into the compiler and then the compiler will check everything and you know compile it and then it's going to fix some of these uh, performance issues like for example it will make some improvements to your code uh, and then it's going to run it, right? If, you, if it finds methods like this, which is going to be a problem, it's going to tweak it, and it's going to make sure that this is not going to be executed again and again. So compiler has a lot of other work to do as well, right? So what happens is compiler will take some time, and then it'll give you the uh, output as an object file, right? A binary file is being spit out from a compiler. But the problem is compiler will take, take some time. But in an actual scenario, you know, when you're running JavaScript on the browser, what happens is the user is looking at your website and he's not going to wait until this come you know the entire code is loaded and then the entire code is fed inside your compiler and you know it takes some time to, to compile and then get give you the, give the result that is not what uh, a user wants you know i cannot just sit and drink my coffee while this thing is going on right i'm not going to wait which is the reason why you know people thought okay for this web website case i cannot do that because the user will not wait for each and every file to be compiled so we need things to be run immediately like faster that's the reason why they started off with interpreter they chose interpreter so that the code as it is downloaded you know line by line let's say you know byte by byte things are getting downloaded this will just immediately execute things as it is coming in right it will not just wait for the entire file to be downloaded and then compile instead it will just run immediately which is why you are able to see something happening on the website right away when you type google.com or facebook.com or whatever right so you understand the uh, use case why we have uh, javascript as interpreted right so now what people thought was okay interpreted is we need to have it as interpreted but we still have this problem which is unresolved right interpreter is going to compute this function again and again now, this is just a simple example an add function but your application might have something even complicated than this so in that case if it's going to run for more than twice it's not acceptable for me as a developer right so i need to figure out how to solve that so now let me ask you one more question. How will the computer interpret a JavaScript file, right? So when I pass, uh, like I said, you know, I don't want to write machine language, so I am writing JavaScript, you know? I don't want to write ones and zeros and send to the computer and talk to the machine. Instead, I'm going to write JavaScript. I've decided that this is my choice of language. So now I'm writing JS and I'm sending it to the computer. Now the, the computer will not understand JavaScript also. Right? Why? Why do you think the JavaScript uh, doesn't work right now by default? Because you know the machine is looking for machine language, right? Yeah. So machine is looking for machine language, and but I'm not sending machine language. I'm sending a JavaScript code. So still, it's not going to work, right? So as you see in this particular uh, slide, you know JS on the left side I have JS file, and the right side computer is saying what? You know he's looking for zeros and ones, but you are sending JavaScript functions and vars and etc. Right? So he is still confused. It is the same as you talking to the computer in English, right? He is not going to understand it, right? So now, what can you do to make this computer understand JavaScript? Right? Can you tell me that? Like, who is going to do that? How does the machine understand JavaScript, first of all? Like, when I download something, like, on my browser, google.com, and google.com you know, comes with a lot of JS files. So the minute it's downloaded, who is going to be uh, helping the computer understand the JavaScript code? Can you just type out the answer? Can you broadcast your answer? Kishore says JS engine. Yep, correct. Browser, yeah, the browser does it, but who, what kind of, uh, you know, agent inside the browser is going to do that? Browser as a whole is a full package. It has so many things, right? So who is going to do this? That's the question. Interpreter, huh? Mm -hmm. No, not, not that, yeah. So some people are like, correct. So, so there's like, we need a JavaScript engine there, right? Correct. Yeah. So JavaScript engine, C++. Come on, man. What is this? 
Okay, so JavaScript engine is the right answer built into the browser, right? So every browser must have JavaScript engine for it to be able to understand your uh, JavaScript code. If I'm just sending a JS file to my browser and assume that this browser does not, doesn't have a JavaScript engine, then it's not going to work, right? It's going to fail. Um, so that's the reason why we are introducing a JavaScript engine in between. So he is going to be like a translator or an interpreter uh, who is going to translate what I say to what the machine wants to hear. Right. So, you know, this machine in between, this is like the uh, interpreter or our translator, right? This is called the JavaScript engine that I'm going to fit right in between my JavaScript file and the computer. So now he's going to say, yes, I'm on it, boss. I understand what you're saying. You want me to render a page, I'll render. You want me to render a picture, I can render, right? So now what is this JavaScript engine, right? Uh, you might be asking, dude, what is this? I have never heard of JavaScript engine. Some of you have already heard about it, but somebody will say, right, okay, I haven't heard of JavaScript engine. What does it do, right? So now what we talked was JavaScript engine is acting like a mediator to translate you know, my language into what the computer will understand you know, from JavaScript to machine language. So how does it do is through the browser, obviously, but browser as such, it cannot do. So browser has this component called JavaScript engines, right? JavaScript engine are also known as ECMAScript engines. So these are some of the examples, V8, Spider Monkey, JavaScript Core, Chakra. These are some of the examples, but you can go to this below link if you want to see a complete list of all the JavaScript engines that are available, OK? I'm putting V8 on top because that is like the most popular uh, JavaScript engine that is available right now. It's created by Chrome, right? Google created Chrome, uh, and they had this V8 engine, which was revolutionary because they had a lot of uh, improvements done in it. So this was able to, like V8 engine was able to run JavaScript in a really good speed that other uh, engines couldn't do, right? So that was the case. Safari. No, oh, I haven't missed Safari, man. Safari also uses uh, this one, JavaScript Core. JavaScript Core is the uh, engine used by Safari, right? V8 is used by Chrome, and then Spider Monkey is used by uh, Mozilla Firefox. Chakra is used by Microsoft. You can just take a look at this in uh, your Wikipedia, right? Cool. So, OK. Mm. Nitros, huh? Is it like updated? Mm. So now, what happened was, you know, JavaScript, the way JavaScript works kind of changed when Google came up with the V8. Now, when did they uh, release uh, EV8? Back in 2008. Why? Because back then, Google didn't have their own browser. Uh, everybody was probably using IE or Safari or maybe uh, Firefox, OK? I was, all, I was using Firefox back then. Um, so Google was not able to achieve the speed that they wanted to achieve while rendering their products, you know, Google Maps and uh, uh, you know, Gmail or whatever. So they were thinking like, you know, let's optimize our code, let's op optimize our application to make it, you know, attain the maximum speed that it can run on browser. But still they had some issues because Maps is complicated. Maps has a lot of animations, a lot of interactions to it. So they couldn't achieve what they wanted to. So then we're thinking, okay, they hit a point where they couldn't optimize their code more, okay, because they have done whatever they could. And they were wondering like, what else can I do? So then, then they thought, OK, maybe it's because of the JavaScript engine. Maybe if the JavaScript engine can be improved, then my code will work really well, right? But now they didn't have the browser. They, they were already you know, running on other platforms, like for products built by other companies. So then they decided, OK, let's create our own uh, JavaScript engine. And for that, you know, go ahead with our own browser, right? So that is when they realized uh, you know, they needed a new JavaScript engine that could perform, like outperform all the other engines. And uh, they had to ship Chrome around that time. Right, to make sure that they have a, a, you know better interactions for their products. Right, so Google was uh, you know releasing this in 2008 and 2009. Immediately, Node.js was born because Node.js uh, runs on top of V8. So it's basically using V8 to uh, interpret and uh, you know run the JavaScript code on the backend also. Right, these are just facts, but we'll come back to that a little later. Okay. So now this is what um, the JavaScript engine looks like inside. Okay, we will see step by step what happens in the JavaScript engine, because you know earlier I told you that JavaScript engine is responsible for reading my JavaScript code and then converting it to the machine-related language, right? Uh, in my case, it's going to be bytecode, so it's going to convert my uh, JS into bytecode, so the machine can understand. The browser will be able to render something. Like for example, if I want to show a picture of Spider-Man or if I want to show a header, everything is. Uh, displayed, you know, why? Because, you know, it's converted to the bytecode eventually. So these are the things that 
uh, are already there inside the engine, but we will look at it. Like first one is parser, and then this AST tree, and interpreter, profiler, compiler, right? So people might be thinking, you know, earlier earlier it was stopped um, like with the interpreter. Like all these other things were not part of it, but in from V8 these things started. Like people started um, thinking that you know uh, you could also in include a compiler along with it and make this work. But but you might be wondering like how interpreter and compiler is going to do the job, right? It wouldn't it be like a chaotic or how this is going to work, right? So I'll talk about that. So first time when you send a JavaScript file, what happens is there's a parser which is going to parse and you know break down uh, your code into small small uh, tokens, right? And these tokens are being uh, taken by the AST tree, abstract syntax tree. It's going to just take these broken tokens and it's going to construct a tree structure, you know, parent, children, node, and et cetera, because it's always, the computer understands better when it's in a tree structure, right? So it takes the token, creates AST, and then it sends it to the interpreter, right? So then now the interpreter is going to execute things immediately, as and when it can make sense of a part of the code, it's going to immediately execute, and you see the output on the browser, because this interpreter is spitting out bytecode immediately, you know, as and when it can make sense of something, it's going to just immediately spit out the bytecode, and you see something happening on the browser. Now, let's say I am showing an animation on the browser, right? The interpreter has done its job and the animation is working right now. Now, there's this other guy, you know, this old guy with the telescope here in this picture, he's the profiler. So he's going to come slowly and then he's going to look at this code that is already running, right? That came from the interpreter and he's going to read through it and say, hmm, there seems to be some problem here. You know, probably, you know, this could be uh, faster than this. You know, this animation is good, but it's consuming a lot of memory. It could be faster. So let me just you know send it to my friend uh, compiler. So he's going to pass this to the compiler next and say you know dude just you know take a look at this code and see if you can you know make something you know, do your magic and make it run faster because right now it's like creating a lot of problem in the browser, and uh, you know who knows you know some people are using old browsers uh, or they might not have enough memory in their laptop it could crash the browser, right? So this profiler guy he's going to send uh, the data to the compiler and then the compiler is going to look at the code and figure out how it can optimize and up, send out the optimized code eventually, right? So what happens is right now, this bytecode is already running, okay? It got the bytecode, it's running on the browser. The user sitting in front is going to see that output. But as it is running, as the user, you know, I'm seeing this output, this thing happens behind the scene. The compiler is going to just compile us and then get an optimized code and it inject back again into the browser. Now, as I'm seeing this output, this output itself is getting optimized, you know, without me knowing it. I can't figure out, I cannot say that, you know, hey, I just saw, now this is working really well. Earlier it was not working well, now it's working well. I can't see that because that is how fast these things work. Immediately it's getting optimized and it's going to get updated. So the app that is running on my browser is getting updated automatically without me knowing it, right? So this is the cool thing that happens within the V8 uh, JavaScript engine, which is why, you know, they made JavaScript like really powerful. Earlier, you know, from uh, JavaScript being very slow, now JavaScript has become much powerful and runs faster than before. Okay, so we'll get, get into this. Okay, this is what we know as the JIT compiler, just-in-time compiler, which, which combines both the interpreter and the compiler, right? That's why it's called a just-in-time compile. It does things immediately. It doesn't make you wait and all that, right? But it's getting the things done. It optimizes as well. Uh, let's say, we go back to the previous slide and show you this add function that we created. Now, JavaScript has both interpreter and compiler. Right? So it will be able to understand that, oh, this add function is being called. So this compiler will come in and optimize it eventually. First, it will just in, uh, compute the add function and show you the result. But then the compiler will step in and modify things to make it more uh, efficient. That is done with the just-in-time compiler. Okay, So let's see what happens in the browser. OK, so what happens is, first time when I download the HTML page, you know, when I type google.com or whatever website that you want, the first thing that I get is the HTML page, right? So when I get the HTML page, the HTML parser in the browser, it kind of reads through the code and it renders the elements onto the page, right? It's going to create the DOM tree, DOM pictures, you know, header and the P tags or whatever you want to see. It is going to just create uh, the element on the screen, right? So when this parser encounters a particular tag, you know, script tag, it knows that this is where the JavaScript comes in, right? So it can understand that script tag has uh, some value that is going to give me a JavaScript and I need to take care of it. So like this, in this example, you know, when it sees a script tag, it knows that there will be a source attribute, which is going to have some kind of a URL here, you know, 
uh, you know, it will download some, we will have to download some JavaScript or we have to get the JavaScript file and do something with it. So there are multiple ways in which this is handled. You know, the, immediately when the parser sees the script, it knows that it has to do one of these three things. You know, one is to fetch the um, so JavaScript file from the network, you know, because if it is not downloaded, if it's the first time you are running this particular page, uh, and then it is going to download it from the network, right? So that is one. Second is, if it is already downloaded, it can just fetch it from the cache. Third thing is, there might be a service worker that is used by, you know, latest frameworks like, you know, React. If you're building PWAs, uh, right, progressive web apps, you'll probably be using a service worker that will just, you know, install these scripts separately. So you can fetch the uh, script from the service worker. So these are the three ways in which you will be fetching it. So at the moment you see uh, the parser sees a script, uh, it will know that, you know, hey, I have to go and fetch this from one of these three location. And then there are a set of actions that I want to do, right? So this is how it is happening, right? So it is going to fetch it from the network. Let's assume that, you know, right now we are downloading something for the first time. So it's downloading from the network, first of all, right? So you, you see this, uh, you know, bytes going in. You know, it's downloaded. As it is downloaded, it's coming to the byte stream decoder. Okay, the byte stream decoder is going to decode whatever it comes in. As I'm downloading these bytes, because this entire JavaScript file is being coming in as byte, not just one single file at a time. It is going to be split into bytes, and I'm getting it as a byte. Right. So the byte decoder, right? It's going to take all these bytes and then decode it, and then give it to the parser, converting it back to the code that we wrote. You know, functions and you know keywords and etc. Right? So that is the work of a decoder. Now this decoder, when it sends it to the parser, parser will be reading it, reading what, reading the tokens, and then it's, it needs to make sense of it now. So it takes the tokens and then puts it back together to form the function or to form the all these uh, you know calls or class or whatever we have written. Right? So now the past parser is able to make sense out of it. You know, okay, this is the function definition, this is the variable definition, this is the function invocation. Right. So now with these details, it's going to create the AST, AST syntax tree, you know, like it was happening before. Right. This uh, JavaScript engine, it kind of did the reverse of this. You know, it broke things and, you know, it kind of, kind of created all these things. But now again, when it comes back to the browser, we have to do all these things again, you know, in the reverse manner. So it takes these keywords and then it's going to create a tree out of it to define that, okay, this is a very variable and this is a function call and this is the definition of a function and so on. Right. So once this AST tree is completed, right, this is being pushed as a bytecode, right? This this is being pushed as a bytecode into the browser, and the browser is able to right, immediately execute it. Right? That's how you see a web page rendering on your browser, or something happens, you know, a code is being evaluated and you see an output in your browser because this is what happens. The interpreter walks through the AST and generates a bytecode. Right? But what happens is after generating the bytecode, this AST tree is immediately deleted. Okay, this left side AC tree, you know, once it gets a set of information, it's going to create a tree, push it, and then delete it. And again, it's going to download the rest of the data that is coming in as byte, decode it, parse it, and then create a tree out of it, again, convert to byte stream, I mean, byte code, and then push it to the browser. So this thing is going to happen again and again. Okay, let me just uh, show it to you once more. Okay. So from the network, you know, it's downloading these bytes, coming into the decoder. Decoder is going to take it and then convert it into what keywords right it's going to convert it into tokens not keywords tokens give it to the parser so now the parser is going to read through and figure out how it can make sense of these tokens that uh, we have got right it's selecting all these tokens and then figuring out okay ah, now i understand this is a variable definition this is a function definition so it's creating the ast tree now this ast tree is you know responsible for spitting out the bytecode which you see as an output on the browser, right? The image is loaded, an interaction happens, a balloon flies, whatever it is, right? That is how it works. Okay, so now this is another important part. This is how the interpreter works, right? It takes something, you know, decodes it, and then push it, uh, push it back to the browser as a bytecode, and you see some output. But when there is something that needs to be optimized, there is this extra thing that we need to do, right? From the bytecode, this code needs to be sent to the optimized compiler and the optimized compiler will check through and find out what is the what is the part of this which can improve so that is what the optimized compiler does so after generating the bytecode and after running the bytecode which means the user is seeing the output right now now we are taking this code and also sending it to optimized compiler for feedback so the optimized compiler is going to take a look at this bytecode along with the type feedback and it's going to figure out okay let me see if this code is okay or not 
And if he finds out that, uh, no, this one was not optimized before, and let me optimize it immediately. If it was already optimized, it will know by this type feedback. Type feedback will, uh, will have the same data. So it will check and say, OK, this, this data I've already optimized, and this is running again and again. It's OK, fine, no problem. But sometimes it will see and say, oh, no, I think uh, this bytecode is new, and I have not optimized it. So it's going to take a look at it and you know now do the optimization like this. Okay. So this animation was like an interesting thing done by Lydia Haley. So I should give her credits for creating this animation. I'm using her work inside my slide. Right? So then I missed out uh, these two things. We'll talk about this also. So now you know how um, this interpretation happens, and then how compiler happens, right? The com interpretation is going to do things immediately. As in you get these files uh, downloaded, I mean lines downloaded, you are just executing this JavaScript code and getting some output immediately for the user so that you don't lose the user. User, he's looking at the screen and he's happy that he sees the balloon or whatever, right? Then what happens behind the scene without the user knowing, you are going to send it to the optimized compiler, and the compiler is going to uh, check the code and see, OK, I can optimize this part, or maybe I can optimize this. And he's going to make some changes and inject it back. He's going to update the bytecode. That's it, right? Earlier, there was some, a pattern for bytecode. Now the pattern is taken and updated. That's it. So now it's, this is how it happens in real time. It just keep on like checking for updates, and it's going to modify it. If it is already optimized, it will know that, OK, I have run this code already. I don't need to optimize. If not, it's going to update it, optimize it. OK, so that is how uh, the JavaScript engine works. So so far, what we are talking about is the JavaScript engine part, right? where I take the code and understand, uh, you know, I convert it to something that the machine can understand. right? And apart from that, there's these two things that you need to know. Inside the JavaScript engine, uh, there is this call stack and memory heap. I think I should go back to the previous uh, screen, so you'll be able to understand this better. Ah, here. So here, you know, we didn't look at these two pictures here. It has call stack and memory heap, right? So we were only talking about these things so far. Parser, AST, interpreter, and then interpreter is sending it to the compiler. Compiler is optimizing code and spitting it out to the computer, right? But then there is these two things that is also going to help with running your JavaScript code, call stack and memory heap. Memory heap, as the name suggests, it is going to handle your memory, right? So when you create a variable or a function, there needs to be a uh, memory allocation that should happen on the operating system, right? Mm -hmm. So this memory heap, JS, JS memory heap, it talks to the kernel, and then it's going to update your uh, memory allocation. Like it's going to say, you know, I need to allocate this kind of memory. Can you please do something about it? And the OS is going to say, yes, I'll, I'll do this for you. And, and whenever it wants to free some memory, it's going to again communicate with the kernel and say that, you know, hey, we have freed this memory for you. So like that, you know, uh, there's some memory things happening, memory management happening through the JS memory heap. OK, so that is about memory key. But we'll talk a little more about call stack, because call stack is how your JavaScript executes. All the code that you write will, will work in a certain manner you know, by going inside this call stack. So let's just see why, like how this uh, call stack works. To understand this call stack properly, we can look at this uh, code and see how uh, this code will be executed. Right? <clears throat> so this is what we have. There's just three function, print name, find name, and then say name, inside which I'm calling these other functions, right? So now what happens is these, when the code is reading this particular line, it knows that this is a function declaration, right? So now it's not going to run anything. It's just going to create a memory uh, allocation here for defining this function. That's it. Nothing is going to run, or nothing is going to be printed or uh, what, whatsoever. This is just going to allocate this uh, memory and declare this function. And again, when it comes to the next line, again, same, function declaration. This one is also function declaration. Now, last line, you know, this is where the thing happens. You know, this is where things start to run. When it sees a function name which with the uh, you know, open close braces, then it knows, OK, oh, this is where I need to start now. Because above, I just had memory allocation. I, I don't know what to run. So now, when it sees a function name, which this is called as a function invocation, right? So when there's something that is to be invoked, that is when a uh, call stack comes into the picture. OK, so this is how the call stack looks like for that particular programming language. So if whatever programming, uh, sorry, this code that we saw just now, if you want to feed this into the call stack, this is how it creates. So first, what happens is this call stack is like a box. OK, the, we're calling it stack, right? So stack has elements pushed into it and then popped out of it. That is how it works, right? So initially, the stack will be empty. Right? And then as and when it sees the code, it's going to keep on inserting uh, the calls inside. 
So what will go inside this uh, particular stack is just the function calls, okay? Function allocation variables, these things will never come into the stack. Only the function calls, which means this open close braces, right? These names with open close braces, these are the function invocations methods that are going to come into the call stack, right? So first what happens, it reads the file and creates a global uh, you know, scenario first, right? That is, we'll, we'll talk about that later because that is a little uh, deeper stuff. What happens is in the global. Uh, but for now, what you need to know is just whenever it reads a, a JavaScript, whatever it is, you know, it's just going to create a global context first. Right? Global context might have you know, access to this variable and then the uh, global stuff that is need to be, that are to be available at a given point, okay? So there are some default uh, things that needs to be done. So that is called the global context. So those global context gets created, means it's getting pushed into the stack first, okay? And then what happens is now it's going to read through this code, right? And then there's nothing here. So when it comes to this last line, it finds out, okay, this, aha, uh -huh, now I see this function. So which means I'm going to take this and put this inside my stack, push this particular function call into the stack, which is why say my name is appearing on top, you know? it's going to be come from the bottom so first i fill up with global and then second i add the say my name right so now i have added say my name what should i do next okay so what happens is as it's keep pushing inside these function calls and it starts executing also right so when it executes it's going to find out what are the other functions call that i can add to the stack so first thing was say my name so now say my name executes okay when this function executes it says return find name so this function is called now find name function is being invoked right so find, my, find name is being added here on top, see? Now when it tries to run this find my name, I mean, sorry, find name, what happens is it's going to return this particular function, print name, right? So when it says, when it sees this function invocation with this open close braces, it's going to, you know, do what? Just push it into the call stack, right? So that's what you see here, print name. So like this, it's going to keep pushing and pushing to the top of the stack. And then when it can execute something immediately, it'll just pop off. So far, we were just calling, calling, and uh, you know, returning other methods, which is why it's going on adding. But if there is something that can be popped off, uh, something that can be evaluated, then this will be immediately popped off. Okay. So you can look at this in the Chrome Developer Tools, how this particular code works. You know, how uh, this particular function is being like uh, being fed into the stack, and then you know, it keeps pushes pushing more the more of these methods, you know, one by one and what is the order in which it is being popped off, right? So what will happen, first this one is pushed, and then, you know, like I said, uh, say my name is calling this function, so this is getting pushed, find name, and find name is pushing print name, and then print name, when it tries to execute, uh, it has no other functions to be pushed. It only has written Magesh string, right? It, it doesn't have to push anything to the call stack now, it has to just simply return a string. So now at this point, this string is returned, and then this print name function will be popped off this stack. So on top of the stack, this print name uh, that you see here is going to be popped off. It means it's cleared, it's removed, right? Again, and then it comes to the next one and says, okay, now I've, I've done doing this, right? So now find name has been complete. So let me remove find name also, and then come back to this and say, what, do I have any other code in this function? No, I don't have anything else. So this is also done. So I'll clear this also. So like that, when, when popping, it's going to pop from the top. When adding, it's going to add from the bottom, right? So first global was added and say I mean, added. So it goes on like this to the top. And then from the top, it is going to stop popping off, right? Once everything is popped off and there's nothing in the call stack, which means your program is ex executed, completed, and that's it, there's nothing more to do. When there's something inside the stack, it means this, uh, you know, the JavaScript runtime will be working to solve these things, to figure out you know, how to evaluate these functions and get an output. If it needs to refer to a memory, to get a variable function and et cetera, it will do all that and get your output displayed to the user, right? That's what happens in this case. Okay, now I'll show you this in live. So for this, what I'll do is I'll stop my screen uh, here and then I'll get back to, uh, maybe I can open up another window or let me see if I can do this here itself. Um, okay. Are you able to see my uh, console in this page? I don't think you can see it. Can you see it? Can you type yes if you can see my uh, JavaScript console? Or no if you don't? Oh, okay, no. Okay, okay, got it. I, I think I should. I need to share this, stop this and share that instead. Hold on. Let me do that. Mm, I have stopped it. Now let me go back to Chrome and see how I can share that. Mm. OK. 
okay for that i think uh, okay, application okay i'll do one thing for this use case alone let me Just give me a second, just getting it out. Okay, then I will share my uh, entire screen in this case, just for this one, and then I'll quit it. Sharing screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Can you see my uh, this one? The console, JavaScript console, the developer tools, Chrome developer tools. Can you see it? Just give me. Okay, cool, awesome, mm -hmm. perfect. So we'll do this here. So here, I can just simply you know, right click on my web page. This whole presentation is created using React, actually. Uh, so this is just a web page, nothing else. So I just have to right click and then click on uh, in uh, web, tool, web developer tools up. And then here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to source code. Okay, Sources is an option where you know I can save a lot of snippets here um, on the left side. I can create new snippets. I can you know, store whatever snippet that I want to uh, save here. Right. So here, what I'll do is, let me. Um, I think I might have created already. Uh, yes, I have this function here as as a snippet. I might have done this in the last workshop. So here, what I'm going to do is, I have this code written here inside this, and um, just before calling the say my name function, I am going to call a debugger. Okay. If you want, I can also increase the size. If it, this is not very clear, mm. right. So here, what happens is. With the debugger, I will be able to see that you know what is happening line by line because the debugger will stop executing things one by one, and then you know I can pause it right here on the right side, and then I can just wait and see what is the next step going to be. It's like one by one, I can just enable this one step and then see what happens. Again, I can enable one step and see what happens. So it's like pause, pause and play, pause and play. So that is how I can uh, figure out what exactly is happening. So on the right side. Just below this watch, you have call stack, right? Uh, you can just open this call stack. Right now, it says nothing inside, just not paused. And this code is not running right now, so it's empty. Call stack is empty right now. But the moment I start running, it will have these items added to the stack, and then push and pop will happen. But the reason why I'm adding debugger here is because I wanted to do a, do it in slow motion. I want to stop, I want to pause, and then see it run. Otherwise, what will happen? It will just run this entire thing, and it will push everything and immediately pop everything. This will all happen in a fraction of uh, microseconds, and then things will go I mean, a fraction of seconds, and then things will just uh, be cleared. So you won't be able to see what is happening within this call stack, which is why we are going to slow slow mo this entire thing with the debugger and see what exactly happens. Right? For that to work, what I'll do is I'll just run by clicking on this particular button. Okay. So when I run, right right now it executes one and it's pausing it. Okay. Let me just um, scroll this thing again, just reduce it. OK, so here, what happens is, first you see in this call stack, are you able to see this one? The call stack has anonymous. Anonymous is nothing but the, uh, the global context is being added. I told you in that uh, previous screen, right? You will be adding, you'll be seeing the global global context added as the first item in the call stack okay we'll look at this image later but this is how it is so first thing is anonymous because this particular script file does not have a name so it is just saying anonymous if the script had a name it will show a name here probably right so here this is just a random script that i'm running without any name so global context is added at this point called anonymous right so now again i'm going to let's just execute the next step into the next function call let's see what happens next uh, so when i click on next you see now it's going to read this particular function now. OK, so so far what we have, we only have anonymous inside and nothing else. Now it reads the same my name function. That is the first thing that it reads, because the previous functions are all definitions, which means memory allocations. 
So now it's going to execute this particular one, right? So when executing, it has to push into the call stack. So when I click on the next action, you see bottom you have anonymous and on top of it, you have say my name, right? Now it is going to try and execute the say my name function. And it's at this line to reading, it's reading this particular function because that is the next item that is going to be added to the call stack. So if you just you know jump to the next execution, you see find name is added now, cool. So uh, say my name was added and now find, my, find name is added. And it is reading the code inside find name to see what it can do now. How, how does it execute this thing, right? So here you have another function call, which again needs to be pushed into the stack. And never you see this function call, it has to be pushed into the stack. There's no other way. If there's something else like a console log or return something, then it doesn't go into the call stack. Instead, it'll just get printed. But if there is a function call like this, then it definitely has to go into the cons this call stack. Right, so now print name will come inside. Just click on this particular button again and see what happens. Yeah, print name is here, right? So now inside print name, here I don't have other functions. So I can't keep on adding more functions. Now I just have to return this name Magesh, right? So what it'll do is it knows that, okay, I have to return this uh, Magesh. So it'll, it'll just remember this thing saying, okay, Magesh is supposed to be returned, right? So cool. So now let me pop off this uh, function print name. So when I step into the next function, Okay, it, it, it knows that Magesh has to be returned finally. So return value will be Magesh, right? So now in the call stack, you can see that print name is gone. We only have find name. So print name is popped off. Now it's looking at find name to see if there's anything else that I need to do. There's nothing much, right? So in the next execution, even find name will be popped off, this, this one, find name. So when I click on that, find name is popped off. Then say my name is there. So next execution, that will also just pop off. That's it. If I go one step ahead, this call stack will get cleared. Okay, this call stack is getting cleared, and then you see this value coming in. Magesh is the final thing that is supposed to be returned. Like once the call stack is empty, it is you know done with it. Okay, so finally, what I see is just the return value. There's nothing else my code did. So this is how your uh, this thing works, right? Call stack works. You can play around with this in your own browser later and see uh, how you can how your code is getting executed. This is a very simple example, but even though you write a lot of code, you know, it has thousand lines of code, it's all executing in the same manner as it is right now. Okay, let me go back to that presentation. Okay, I hope you all understand that. Okay, if you have any questions with that, you can ask me. I will definitely clear things up for you. You can put it in the Q&A box, right? So let me share uh, the presentation again so we can continue. Right. Mm. Okay, we are back here. Okay, so so you understood, right? You saw how uh, call stack executes. Right. I'm just checking through the question to see if anybody has any question. Okay, cool. Nobody has question. It's either you understood it properly or <laughs> you understood nothing. So I don't know what which uh, this thing. Is. Where are you right now? Anyway, cool. So that is how the call stack works, right? You can play around with it. And then now, when what happens? You know, when the when the call stack is full, what will happen? You know, let's say earlier I showed uh, this thing, right? So here, if you keep on adding functions like this, you know, uh, every time when I read a function, it's going to have written some function name, written some function name. So it's going to keep on adding one more stack, one more stack, and it's not popping out anything because there's nothing to pop right now. All I see is return a function. So there's too many functions getting added to the call stack, and there's a limit for that. There's something called a stack size. Okay, For any programming language, there'll be a stack size. And for this browser, there's a stack size. So when it reaches that particular stack size, it is going to say, oh, dude, that's it, man. I have, I have nothing to do. I'm going to collapse. That's it. OK, so that is when you see a browser crash happening. Okay? You'll be wondering, like, what happened? Because you exceeded the crash. I mean, sorry, exceeded the stack limit. OK, for this one, every browser has its own uh, limit. OK, people are saying, gotcha. OK, cool, awesome. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So when you reach the limit, when the stack size has been exceeded, that is when an error message pops up. You know, that is what we call as the Stack Overflow error. OK, that I think that is how they named this website called stackoverflow.com. People might be wondering, hey, how did they came up with this uh, cool name, Stack Overflow? This is where it comes from. You know, when something goes wrong, you know, the stack gets filled up and nothing to execute more then the stack collapses. That's called the stack overflow. So you'll get a stack overflow error message in Java or JavaScript. Any programming language, you have this problem. When the stack limit is reached, 
there is a stack overflow error happening right so if you want to try that you can you know probably run this code to see uh, the stack overflow happening because this is like a inception code you know recursive code is keep on running adding code again and again so when it reaches the limit of stack size it cannot go and add one more function to it so it will say dude i'm done man i'm collapsing so that is when you'll see a browser crash happening if you run this code it will give you an error saying you know stack overflow uncaught range error maximum call stack size exceeded this is the error message that you'll see so when you're writing code you should make sure that you know all this code that you write should not keep on adding more things to the stack it should be cleared also at the same time so that is something that you need to know so once you understand the call stack concept whatever we talked about just now you need to keep this mind while you're writing javascript code to make sure that there will be uh, you know code popping out immediately when you enter a function into the callback uh, the call stack it has to be popped off immediately it should not stay there for a long time meaning it leads to adding too many uh, you know calls into the stack which will lead to this error right so what is the maximum call stack size it depends from browser to browser right so if you want to find out the call stack size there's this program that you can write uh, to find out again this is a recursive function so what happens is this recurse function keeps calling this uh, function again and again right and then what we are doing is every time when you call it you are storing this i value and then incrementing it one by one and what happens at one point it will just uh, throw error right so when it crashes at that point you can print this i to see what number it is right so if you see that i it will give you one of these numbers so if you are using chrome it will be 15 15674 if you are using firefox it's like 11767 i tried this actually <laughs> that is how i got this thing when i was creating this slide right earlier uh, yesterday i was just you know working on this and i was just uh, i printed this and uh, noted down so 15k roughly you can just say 15k is the chrome limit and 11k is the firefox limit so i you might also have a different thing and chrome your uh, safari might have a different limit so you need to be aware of things so 70 15k you know is the stack size if you keep on adding more function invocation on top of this it is going to crash it can't handle anything more than this right so now let's uh, i think someone commented about garbage collection so we are going to talk about that also um what if someone is asking a question like what if we are doing an api call during this execution will stack wait for the response to come and it does not no 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 actually uh, stack the stack right it is completely uh, uh, synchronized it's in synchronized format it's not asynchronized it's synchronized it will just execute one by one immediately it was it's not going to wait for anybody to come back with an answer it will see a function invocation and just call it that's about it it will not know how to call a api or wait for an api or it will not know how to do a dom manip manipulation it only take care of these function calls these function invocation which does not involve uh, any of these things like for example in in this case if i am going to call an api ajax call within a function what will happen is it will just run the it will just add this function to the call stack and then it keep going to the next step okay it will see this api call maybe call it okay push it and then keep going it will not wait for this api to come back with a response because it will just execute it in synchronized fashion right it doesn't understand how async works right slider oh sorry previous slide this is the one so this is about stack right? so for a call for a uh, you won't be able to do that for async the event loops comes into the picture uh, yes async it's a different story i will talk about that little later uh, i don't know if i can cover this in this uh, session but we will talk about that in part 2 if i can't do it now we'll see <clears throat> anyways i i can brief it a little bit though so if you are dealing with um, you are dealing with a uh, uh, async call what happens is this javascript engine the this call stack cannot handle it actually anything that the call stack cannot handle can be you know a dom manipulation or an async call that is being handled by the runtime for you the browser has something called as a web apis right so browser web apis will take care of these things so browser web api will uh, find out that okay this is you know something that uh, is not going to work inside the stack and i'm going to pull it and take it from the stack and then it's going to uh, process it separately right so browser web apis in the runtime that will take care of these kind of things async calls right so how does it take care is yes you know someone has mentioned that you know it's using event loop yes there is something called as event loop but we'll talk about it later okay how i think i have an image for that also let me go to that image uh, yes sir yes sir so oh, i think i have a lot of other things to go okay we'll we'll come to that a little later then okay 
async call, that's a different story. We'll come to that later. So now let's look at the uh, garbage collected thing, right? So here, uh, when you look at programming languages, uh, Java, JavaScript and all, these are all garbage collected language. Ruby, Python is all like that, right? So there are also languages which are not garbage collected, meaning um, memory uh, allocation and then releasing memory to the free pool is not automated. So developer, you have to write code and say, you know, hey, I need to allocate this much of memory. And then I need to release this kind of memory. So all these things are manual. There are two different ways of doing this, you know, memory, manual memory allocation and then automatic memory allocation. So garbage collection come, comes into the picture when you are using an automatic memory allocator, right? So when I'm dealing with these languages, JavaScript, I don't have to care about the memory allocation or clearing the memory. This guy, you know, dressed up like a robot, he's going to come and clean things. Uh, he's the garbage collector. Right? So he's making things easier for me. So I don't have to deal with the memory management things, right? So um, garbage collected languages help developers to manage memory by periodically checking, right? So this guy is going to go and check my code to see, you know, if there is like need for this particular uh, item in the memory. So if there's a variable, let's say there's a variable in the memory, he's going to check and see if there's any reference to this variable. Is my like rest of the code, does it need this variable or not? If he thinks that, okay, this variable is not used anywhere in the rest of the programming and the previous thing is already executed, now he's going to say that, oh, okay, then so this is a waste. This variable is not required, so let me just suck it up. Right? He's going to just remove it and throw it off. So that is how this guy is going to work. Okay, so how does the garbage collector work? It's like this. He's going to mark some of these items that are already in reference. Okay, So he's going to find out what are the variables and functions that has a reference to the root node Okay, to see that whether it's going to be used or not. So rest of my code is going to need this particular variable and function or not. If I'm going to call this function you know, down the line, then I need to keep this in memory, right? I cannot just clear this, I have to wait. So this guy will check all this code and see, okay, fine, um, this particular code you know, cannot be deleted because it is it has a reference and it is going to be used in my later code, right? In another file or something like that. So he's going to leave it. So he's going to mark all these things like in this blue, in this GIF image, you can see this blue color that is the ones that are with reference, okay? So it is going to mark all these things with reference, right? Uh, which is being used in my code right now and it's, it cannot be deleted. So after marking all these things which cannot be deleted, you can isolate the red ones that are uh, not used in my program, which means these are orphan objects or whatever it is that is flying around, which is maybe used already, but nobody has cleared it. So it is still floating there. So he's going to just say that, okay, let me sweep this off, okay? So this is called as mark and sweep. There are algorithms that will deal with mark and sweep, mark and sweep algorithm that will take care of memory allocation, right? So this is the uh, example with code. You know, what I'll do is I create an object here, the JSON object like var human, and I give name, Magesh, passion code and all that. So now what happens is this JSON object is created in the memory, right? This is stored in the memory and this is referenced with human variable, right? So now with this object has a reference called variable human, right? But now what happens is in the next line, what I'm doing is human equal to true is what I said now. So what happens, this human reference is now pointing to this new value, this new value called true, right? So what happens to this object? This JSON object is still in the memory, but it doesn't have a reference now. The reference bar human is removed, right? And this is now floating as an orphan child in the free space. I mean, not in the free space, in my code. Uh, but but from now on, how human is equal to true is something that I know. So now the garbage collector at one point, you know, he comes in periodically to check what's going on. So when he comes in, he's going to look at this particular object and say, hmm, okay, this guy doesn't have a reference. He's just floating here. Um, and then he's going to say, okay, uh, if nobody is using this thing, then it should be clear, right? So he's going to just dump this out, take this object and uh, release the memory. So that is how this garbage collector is going to help you free memory once in a while, right? So you need to write code in such a way that these code, when it's not in use, it will be isolated like this, or maybe you are clearing it, you have to manage it efficiently, right? You should not lock this, you know, you should not lock this with a reference uh, not being able to uh, sweep off from the garbage collector. The garbage collector should be able to sweep it off easily. You should not lock this to a variable and say whether it's required or not, it's going to be there always. That is not the way to go, okay? So that is how memory leaks happen, right? When you are not able to clear the memory and there's too much of information in the memory, this is going to uh, you know, cause a memory leak and leads to browser crash and et cetera down the line. Okay, so let's look at what's memory leak. Okay, this is the definition, like memory that is not required by an application anymore and is not released to the pool of free memory. Okay, we have a pool of free memory, 
that the operating system is going to use for allocating to new variables and new functions that are declared later right so now the memory uh, is not able to free uh, i mean this memory allocation the jse is not able to free some memory to the pool right and then you know it's keep on adding more and more variables and function then it at one point it will be uh, stuck it, it won't have enough memory to add right so that is when you see memory leaks happening and crash happening right <clears throat> right so that is that for memory leak this is an example so if i keep pushing like this right so this array keeps on adding an element again and again into this i am writing this condition in such a way that it will never reach this particular condition all right so it's all it or it will always be true i mean it will not reach a else case it will always be true right? because the number is going to be uh, greater than 1 right so every time it's going to see this greater than 1 and it's going to keep pushing pushing and uh, this array size is going to get extra like from uh, limited memory size this memory uh element is going to get exceeded right the memory is going to get exceeded and there's no way to clean it also because i am using it i'm still using it this variable is still in use so i can't just delete it the even though the garbage collector will come and look at this he will still not be able to understand if i can clear this or not right okay let me look at the questions reference in stack should the new human the true d without var okay can explain us the development okay uh no i can't explain the developer tool options complete uh, because you know this is limited to this particular session and this i understand human uh, yes if you should use var in the previous screen yes did i miss out a uh, var there i have var here anyway yeah mm. so equal to true d without var oh okay okay you're saying without var huh? okay got it got it this new human without var yes correct because it's already defined as var human so i don't have to use var again yes this is a mistake i can just say human equal to true which is correct i understood what you're saying mm -hmm. all right so now let's get back to that okay so if i try something like this uh, it's going to keep on adding items to the memory and then finally there's no other memory to allocate it's going to crash it's going to say you know sorry there's a problem right so all memory got used and there's nothing i can release to the free memory pool that is how it happens So now we have to figure out ways in which you know memory leaks can happen in our uh, code. So first thing is you have to be very careful with the global variables, right? So how you define global variables? If you are keeping like if you are defining a lot of global variables, you should remember that this global variables are not going to be deleted from the memory until the entire program is completed, right? So in between while it's executing, there's no way it's going to find a, a way to delete this because global memories will always be be there in the memory. um that is why we call it as global variable that is why most of the programming language suggests that as a best practice you shouldn't use global variable unless you you know why exactly you are doing this right you cannot just simply just say hey, let me put it as var a equal to 1 i can't do this just like that in the global uh, context without, without knowing it if i don't know that then you should probably use something like a let or const or other means of writing it don't use var in that case right because var becomes a global variable when it is defined in the global context okay another thing is this one you know accidental global variables sometimes you know people just say uh, sorry hold on uh, yeah this one so ac accidental global variables is you know when i'm writing something you know within a function i miss out the var keyword here you know this var variable is not defined already but i missed out the var now what happens when i miss out the var is you know this will find this as a as an uh, as a global variable and it's going to just add it it will think that okay you missed a reference here so i'm going to just add it to the already existing global context right so this will be the same as this one you know window dot bar so this will go into the global object which is the window so you can see the, the global object when you type window in your console if you go to your javascript console and type window and enter you'll see the global object which has a lot of values right so all your global variables will be present within this window object so now this is also added as one other uh global variable and pushed into the window object right this is a problem this happens by default even when i'm doing this you know when i'm just writing nothing and say bar equal to this it is going to just say okay let me i don't know where should i create this but let me go and create it in the global scenario that's it so that is one problem that we see often so without knowing i accidentally create a global variables which is not going to be wiped out from the memory forever if i have more functions like this without var then it's sometimes i see issues happening like this you know this becomes a global variable without my knowledge and it you know kind of screws me later right and the next thing is 
uh, remove the event listeners. Like whenever we create event listeners in JavaScript, these is, these are like again going to occupy the memory and it's going to be doing something. You know, there's some work going on. It's going to listen for a particular element. In this case, uh, we are listening for this click action, you know, from this button, right? So I'm just going to listen to this button to see when this particular user is going to click. So I'm going to just listen, keep my ear next to it. I'm listening. So some process is going to happen there. So this is continuously running and waiting for the user to click on a particular button. So when I know that, you know, okay, after this particular uh, execution, this listener is not required, I can just remove this listener. I can just use remove event listener and remove it. Okay. You can just go check out these e remove event listeners syntax in the JavaScript documentation and you will do that. But the, this is a common thing that developers do, right? right? We are more focused on, you know, writing this code, making this code work, but not in the efficient way. We just say, okay, I want this button to be clicked and then something should happen. That's it. But I don't see that, okay, I am done with it now. I should go and clear it. Okay, We don't think about that. So from now on, you should probably think on that and remove this to avoid memory leaks. Then another thing is forgotten timers or callbacks. If you forgot these timers and timers are running in the background, that will also be occupying memory and that will not be cleared at all because it's running. It's not going to stop. It's going to run till it reaches a point, right? It reaches a condition that it can actually terminate. Otherwise, you know, you have to terminate it. You have to use clear interval function to create these set time intervals and et cetera. Right? So that should also be done in a cautious way. When you're, whenever you're using these kind of timers or callbacks, you make sure that these will not be executing, you know, uh, continuously. It should be, it should be terminated at one point and then cleared from the memory. You should make sure that happens. Right? So now, uh, is JavaScript single threaded or multi-threaded? Next, going on to the next question. Okay, I'm looking at questions. Let's see. Um, Yes, unsubscribed event listener also leads to memory leak. Yes, yeah. So event listeners, when you create event listener, you should you should also get rid of the event listener once you once you are done with the work, right? If you are if you have multiple event listeners, that is also going to be using our memory. That is going to create for problems later, right? That is why you have to release it again. You just remove that event listener and say you know it's not required. Let, what's let's say you have hundreds of event listener and you are not releasing any of that. That's going to create a problem there, right? That's why I said you should clear it. Okay, and then. Um, what is the other question? Won't we get undefined error while assigning value to bar without declaring? No, no, that is not the default way in which uh, JavaScript works, right? JavaScript is a little uh, different. So whenever it finds a variable with, you know, just the name, you know, variable uh, without the bar keyboard, if you define something without the bar keyboard saying, you know, name equal to Magesh, it is going to assume that there's a bar automatically and it will just take it as a bar, right? That is the problem, okay? It, that is done in a way to make it friendly to the user so that it doesn't throw error and irritate the user. But to make it user friendly, they have probably done that. But, uh, you know, for us, you know, it can create different problems, you know, with memories down the line. So you make sure you always have this bar keyboard written next to it, okay? Don't write something just like that, you know, human equal to true, it's not going to be okay. Just write bar if it is not defined already. If it is defined, you can say, okay, it's already defined, so I'll just use human equal to true. It's going to update it, right? But when you are defining a variable for the first time, I cannot just say a name equal to something. Just use this var keyword next to it, or use a different keyword like let const. But don't miss it. If you miss it, that gets that gets accidentally created as a global object, which is something that you don't want, right? Yeah. Single threaded. Yes, correct. Single threaded. Right. JavaScript is all uh, single threaded, not multi-threaded. That is true. Someone is asking for strict mode will help us there. I think. Oh, strict mode. Oh, huh? yeah, yeah. Correct, correct. I don't want to like talk about too many things to confuse people. You can learn about those things later. I'll just go one at a time. <laughs> I think you know when we talk about JavaScript, there's like so many things that we can talk about. So people are asking a lot of questions. But maybe in the Q&A, I can cover it. Just give me a few more minutes. Let me just wind this up. So single threaded, yes, correct. Uh, this is single threaded, meaning single threaded is like you know there's one process running, and then one process is can only for one thread, and it's running with all. It is doing everything with this one thread, right? Uh, there's no multi-threaded thing. I mean, it's, there's, there's only one guy dealing with it, not multiple guys. So one thread is going to come and look at my particular code and execute a certain line and then go to a next file, execute things. So he's like, like running and doing multiple stuff himself, right? So that is in a single-threaded uh, scenario. But in a multi-threaded scenario, there'll be like multiple guys. You know, from one one uh, process, you can fork like multiple threads, and each of the thread can be looking at different parts of your code and execute things. You know, in a different way. So to work with a multi-threaded programming language, you need to have a different perspective. But single-threaded is probably probably like very simple for me to work with because I know for sure that you know this is going to do just one thing at a time. There's not multiple scenario that I need to think of. So at a given time, it's going to just run one thing, and then once it finishes, it's going to go to the next one. 
So it's going to go one by one. Like let's say there's a web request that you're trying to serve. Okay, uh, so it's hitting an API or whatever it is. So first you're going to send one Ajax call or something, and then it is going to wait and do the next call, right? Uh, only when this process is available, you, this thread is available, it's going to go and do the next thing. Okay, so to, to answer this question, whether it's single or multi-threaded, you just know, just count the number of call stack your particular programming language has. In our JavaScript, in the previous images that I showed you, there was only one call stack, right? One box where we added uh, these functions. So there was only one call stack. So if there's one call stack, then it is single-threaded. If there's multiple call stack, then it's multi-threaded. For Java, you'll probably be dealing with multiple call stack. Okay, so single threaded is like this, you know, man eating food, one serving at a time. So I, I'm, I'm sitting and eating food from my plate, mouth, right? And I have to chew it and then swallow and then I can go for the next one, right? I cannot keep like feeding again and again like this without chewing. So I'm just doing it this one thing at a time. That is how single threaded works. Take one work, one task, complete it and then go for the next one, right? That is single threaded, just to give you an example. Uh, example is like restaurant. In a restaurant, in a small restaurant, what happens is there's just one waiter and five tables to be served, right? So now he is going to come to this first table. One waiter is going to come to the first table and then say, you know, what is your order? He is going to take it and then go to the kitchen, deliver the order, and come back and take an order from the second table. So this one guy is enough for me to work for five different tables because he's going to go take order, give it to the kitchen, go take order, give it to the kitchen, you know, take orders from all the five tables. Now, again, you can just wait and see when this particular uh, food is ready. Once the food is ready, he can just go to the kitchen, get it, and give it to that particular table, and then move on to the next one. So for me to deal with uh, this problem, where I have a small restaurant to serve people, I just need this one waiter who can deal with this. right? So this is how the single-threaded scenario works. Synchronous, again, synchronous is like one thing at a time. Synchronous is working step by step. So I can only execute one thing at a time if I'm talking about synchronous. But when I'm dealing with asynchronous, there are like multiple things that can happen. Right? Even with a single threaded programming language like JavaScript, I can still have, you know, choose to handle it in a different way, synchronous or asynchronous. There's two different options that is available to me. But earlier, what I was saying was the JavaScript engine, when it's running things through the call stack, it will not be able to handle async at all. JavaScript engine cannot handle asynchronous, asynchronous stuff. It can only handle synchronous stuff, okay? So, so far, whatever example that we saw are all as, uh, synchronous, not async, right? We didn't see about as, uh, Ajax calls and et cetera, right? So this is what uh, the JavaScript engine can do. But if I want to handle async calls, I would probably leave the JavaScript engine as it is and go to the JavaScript environment, okay? The JavaScript runtime, runtime has another part, okay? I think I have an image for that. Mm. Okay, I'll show you that image later. So this JavaScript runtime has another part called as the browser web APIs. So web APIs will take care of the Ajax calls and um, DOM uh, manipulations, right? And then there is another thing called as event loop that is going to take these um, you know, functions once it's done, like all these async calls, when it's done, when it's complete, it's going to, this event loop is going to take them and then push it inside the call stack later. Only when this is converted to a synchronous process, that is when the call stack can handle. Unless it is synchronous in nature, the call stack cannot handle. So that is why we need a web API to do all these asynchronous stuff. And this event loop guy is going to be a mediator here who's going to pick that from the web API uh, and you know or the callback queue and is going to put it to the call stack. Okay. So problem with synchronous is like the wrong running task. Okay, because it has to wait for one thing to complete and then only it can move on to the next one. So long running task will create chaos. You know, it has to wait and there's nothing happening. Customers will not be happy if you keep running one process for a long time. A classic example is alert hi. So if I just print an alert message with hi in it, um, what will happen is I'll see a box here, right? And we will see a box here which will say hi, and it will ask me to click OK button. So if I don't click OK button, it will not allow me to click any of these other links. OK, I can't click any of these other link. Uh, if I have a button or something, I won't be able to click it because this is still waiting for me to uh, give a response to the alert box. Okay, until I click cancel or OK in the alert box, this particular synchronous task is not complete, right? So I won't be able to click on a different uh, link or a tab or whatever. So this will not let me do anything else. That is the problem with the synchronous thing. Long running task creates chaos, right? So solution for the problem is JavaScript runtime. See, now this is where I said JavaScript uh, engine cannot handle asynchronous stuff. So we are bringing in another guy, you know, JavaScript runtime. Actually, JavaScript engine is part of the JavaScript runtime. You'll understand that when you see the picture. So this is the picture. 
right? This whole box that we see here is called the JavaScript runtime. And this left side gray box is the JavaScript engine. Now you understand, right? This JavaScript engine exists within your JavaScript environment, JavaScript runtime environment. OK, so what are the other things that are there in the JavaScript environment is this web API I'm talking about. So whenever I'm you know pushing things into the call stack, if I find something that is async, what I'll do is I'll just take it and then throw it out. Okay, or this web API will say, okay, okay, I can deal with this. You know, JavaScript engine doesn't know how to deal with it, so I will take it. So web APIs will take it and then you know run it. Whether it's a DOM manipulation or AJAX call or set timeout timers. Okay, all these things are handled by web APIs here, which is available in the runtime, not inside the JavaScript engine. You should remember that. Right? So these guys will handle it and then say, you know, once I convert this async operation into a synchronous, then I'll push it back to the callback queue. Because these guys, web APIs, cannot push things directly to call stack. They can't do that because call stack is already running something. It already has some function which is going on. Synchronous work is being carried out, right? So this web API needs to wait for this to complete, right? So what happens? It will say, okay, let me process something and then put it into the callback queue. There's one more queue. Uh, called callback queue, where it can just process and push things into directly from web APIs. Okay, so this queue will be loaded with items one by one. All these async operations, once they are complete, they'll be pushed into the call callback queue, and then there's like multiple items waiting now. Okay, and there's this guy, this event loop guy. He'll be spinning all the time. So event loop will go to the callback step and check periodically, saying, you know, hey, are you free right now? Hey, are you free right now? Can I, you know, pull back one of this method that I have in the callback queue? So he's going to go and ask this call stack each and every time to see if it's free. So the callback will say, dude, dude, I'm not free right now. Just go and come back later. And then once the call stack is free, which means all the items are popped off from the call stack and there's nothing inside call stack, that is when this will come back to this event loop will come and check, hey, are you free right now? And he'll say, OK, dude, yeah, I'm free right now. Whatever. Just you know, do whatever you want. So then he'll say, OK, fine. Thank you. I'll, I have somebody, you know, a method to be pushed inside. So he'll come and take this first method here and push inside. And then once that is done, you'll take this and push inside. So like that, he's going to push items one by one from the callback queue back into the call stack. But remember that call stack can only handle synchronous stuff. It cannot handle async stuff. So in, for any async stuff, web APIs are responsible. Callback queue is used only for you know whatever output that I get from this web API. So let's say I have an Ajax request. So I'm, saying, I'm hitting a server with an API call. And then the server is giving me an, uh, uh, a response okay so that response needs to do something maybe call a function with a with a response in it so those functions will be pushed inside the callback queue because web APIs can handle api calls uh, like it can wait for some time for the response to come back from the server and once that is done it is going to push it here right but the call stack cannot wait like that he doesn't know that you know we have to wait for this api call to come back he doesn't know about all these things he's like really impatient and he's going to uh, you know keep running things Right? He will just run and he will not wait for a response to come back. But Web API is not like that. They are going to wait till this DOM application manipulation is complete or till this AJAX call is complete. And then whatever is written from here is going to be pushed into the call queue, callback queue. And this callback queue will have all these functions that are in synchronous format now. Async function is executed, waited, and then got back some response. Now it's converted into async task that needs to be pushed into the call stack. Now all these async stacks inside this, um, sorry, not async. All these are now synchronous ta tasks, right? So async tasks converted to synchronous tasks are now being pulled back into the call stack from the event loop, through the event loop, one by one, whenever the, the stack is free, right? So that is how it is. OK, I think um, I think we are done with this. I think it will go. Uh, it'll take more time if I keep uh, going into other details. I still have a lot of things to discuss, but I think it's time uh, that we can close this session right here and maybe i can take a few questions um and you know we can be done with it let me see um we could use let and cons instead of var to avoid issues yes correct so when you use var for uh, okay let me just stop sharing screen <clears throat> okay so what happens is um, okay i think yeah fine <clears throat> so here, like, uh, what is his name? Slok Pandey is suggesting that you know we use let and const instead of var because I said var is going to be created like a global variable if it is not inside a function, right? Um, so in that case, if you think that um, these things are not necessary, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know if I should use var or not. Just go with let or const because let and const are block scope, so that will get cleared immediately after a block is finished, after a function is executed, or after a if if condition is done. 
the variable that is inside it, if you are using let or const, will get deleted. Okay. The variable let and const were available in ES6, not in ES5. Until ES5 version, we only had var. Okay. So let's see why interpreted languages are dynamically typed and uh, compiled languages are uh, statically typed. Uh, honestly, I don't know these things, man. Like, I don't know how he, uh, I, I don't think that all these interpreted languages are dynamically typed. Mm. Because, you know, the, these languages are have a different purpose. For example, if you look at JavaScript, they were dynamically typed because uh, they wanted to make it programmer friendly. Okay, they, want, they wanted to do something that is better than Java and uh, C++ and all. So they thought, okay, we should make it very sim simple for the developer to work on. So they thought dynamically type it might be helpful, so, so that the developer doesn't have to say that you know this is a uh, this particular data type, and that can be done in a dynamic scenario. So I can just simply say var something and equal to. I can put a string there, number there, whatever I want, and it will get uh, you know done. Just just you know giving some extra ways for the developers to you know be a work or get things done in an easy way. Right. So I think that is the reason why they opt for dynamic. They are not saying that, you know, there's no other reason for doing this. Dynamic type is because they prefer to do that. They want things to be easy for the uh, developers, so they do that. Can you share your slide, including React code? That is very cool. Both slide content and slide presentation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jitendra says, my slide is cool. Thank you, man. That is actually a lot of, a lot of these people in the JavaScript community are now using um, this tool called uh, MDX Deck. You can search for it. It's called MDX hyphen Deck. Okay, that is a React based tool that you can use to write some code and uh, create this, uh, this thing with the cool animations. You can have code inside, and it's like very, very easy for me to work with. Can I mention good resource to know more about how JS works inside the browser? Okay, yes. To continue with this, I will probably be doing another session soon. Okay, because right now I am not complete actually. There's few more things, like, not few, there's a lot more things that I have in place, but this is just the start. This is just part one of this fundamental JavaScript session. So we will be doing part two where I'll co co cover more things like, you know, um, the context, global context, the lexical environment, uh, and more things, global object, and etc. Uh, but right now, this is just to give you a start on, you know, uh, understanding these basic stuff. These are fundamental stuff that I wanted to brush with you so that you can clear some of the idea in your head. And uh, since we are doing webinar, I couldn't do this for a long time. So that is why I said, Let's stop here and you know call this part one. And part two can have you know other things. So we will uh, talk about these things in part two session anyway, right? So then what else? If you want a good resource for knowing JavaScript uh, work, you can go for JavaScript.info. There's a domain called JavaScript.info. Just search for it, okay? Or I can uh, broadcast maybe. Okay, when once we finish this question, I'll do that. Okay, just type for JavaScript.info you'll get a website which has a complete details about whatever you need to know about JavaScript, right? So that will have things in a very uh, crisp manner. It's not like detailed blog post that takes hours for you to finish. It's very simple to read with example code and et cetera. Just go through that and uh, you'll be able to understand how JavaScript works, each part of it. Like, for example, if you only need to understand the async part of it, you can just go search for it and read it on that particular website. It's like really cool. OK, the next thing is explain what's stored on environmental record and lexical environment. Lexical environment, I think I, that will be covered in part two, because now I, we don't have time to talk about that. It's, there's a lot of things that we need to talk if I'm talking about lexical environment, the context, and et cetera, right? So I will do that in part two for sure, OK? I'm working on the part two. I will be done with it probably. And uh, we, we will do that in a week or so, right? We can use JS to develop game application. Yes, of course. Uh, nowadays, people are using JS for creating games. React has. Uh, really cool ways and you know uh, using these events like mouse touch uh, mouse clicks and then keyboard events and then also the touch screen events can also be uh, interpreted on using react there are like really good uh, libraries out there and even in react internally supports a lot of these functions for creating animations really cool animations that you might that gives you a, a mobile app like experience it's not like a website it's going to be like a mobile app when you see these cool uh, uh, animations right so that is possible with React. I don't know about the other frameworks, but uh, React, you can do that. And React also has more third-party libraries that you can include to add more uh, cool animations. And you can obviously use games, right? There was one blog post that I saw, you know, Tanya uh, creating a, a snake application, you know, like the Nokia phone a snake application, which was done using just Node.js on the terminal. You just open the terminal, run that JavaScript code, and you'll see snakes running on your terminal. You can play with it. So there are interesting things that you can do with Node.js. And if you want to do it in the browser, I would say just using uh, something like uh, plain vanilla JavaScript along with uh, React, maybe. And there are other tools also for creating games 
yes i haven't explored it much but i know there was like few libraries uh, that were that they were talking about in react conference last year 2019 all browser supports ecma 10 no actually ecma script code no like every browser whether it's chrome or firefox or safari they have some limitations like they some of these browsers support many functions like chrome supports a lot of these advanced functions that are available in 7 8 9 um, but some of these methods might not be available in the other browsers. You know, when you look at uh, Firefox, uh, other things, I'm not sure what are the features that it supports and what it doesn't. Maybe you should go look at their document, their website to see what they support and what they don't support. It is all available online. If you go search for that, you will be able to find it, right? But right now, I'm not very sure on what are the methods. But in Chrome, I have run certain things, you know, um, ES7 syntax, ES8 syntax. I've tried all those things. It works like, pretty well. Even ES9 stuff I, I've tried works very well. Dino versus Node.js. I haven't tried Dino, man. Node.js is something that I've tried, but uh, been a little busy for the last few weeks. I didn't try Dino, but I would like to try Dino. It sounds interesting, actually. It's uh, Dino is this new um, tool that uh, Node.js creator has launched. Okay, he wanted to, uh, you know, create something that is more than Node.js or better than Node.js. So he said that I'll work with Node, and the first version released a few days back. So I need to check that, but I can't really say right now whether you know I vote for Dino or Node.js uh, because it's too early for that, right? When is part two session? Obviously, Karpagam, uh, you're asking this question. <laughs> I will ask, I will do this probably in a week or so. Okay, maybe it will take another week or so for me to get back. I will uh, obviously you know let you know uh, through the Mozilla community, right? Looking forward, awesome guys. Um, then what else? Yes, yes, obviously, man. There's part two of JS fundamentals coming up for sure. I will not miss it. Just follow me on uh, Twitter or Facebook, wherever, so that you will get this update. So when I'm doing part two, you should just come and join. OK? Uh, then I would like you to cover on promise asyncs. Yes, the promise async stuff is covered in uh, part, I don't know, it will come in part two or part three, maybe. Because part two has a lot of details to cover in terms of uh, the execution context, uh, the lexical environment, and things like that. OK, so I don't know if I can push that inside part two. I was thinking it should go inside part three. Part three is where I thought I will cover all these ES6, 7, 8, 9 syntax, things that are like uh, very, very, very interesting. These are all like dry stuff that we are talking about right now, right? Theory. Uh, so I was thinking like I'll put all these more interesting stuff into part three, and that can be a separate session where we see a lot of code you can run. And even part two is code. Part one is like dry, but part two has a lot of code that you'll be looking at and evaluating. So the part two is interesting. Part three will be more interesting than that because we will talk about uh, promising and promise async and etc. Right? I will let you know. I'll keep you guys updated for sure. Then uh, uh, what else? Mm, three JS. I'm not sure. Can't answer that. Um, Dino. I don't know, man. Slok Pandey. I haven't checked out uh, Dino yet. Like I told you, I have it on my pipeline. If I see, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, new tabs available here for me. There are so many tabs open. Uh, Dino is open in one of these tabs, and I'm going to read about it with this week later this week. Um, so I will just put it out on Twitter or something, you know, what I think. You should follow me on Twitter if you want to hear such things. You know, Twitter, I use it mostly for tech stuff. So I'll be sharing all these event-related things and tech stuff on Twitter. Um, polyfills, polyfills I can't cover now, but I can do it when I'm doing React.js. OK, I will be doing React.js also sometime later, not immediately. After covering JavaScript fundamentals, I would go into React. But when talking about React, maybe I can cover polyfills. But now it's too early. OK, I have done React workshops before, like few uh, six months back. I was into completely React workshops. But then I got busy with other mentoring stuff. Uh, right now, I'm mentoring a lot of things in my game. So I, didn't, I couldn't get time to do the session. But now I will have it. I will do that, right? Uh, I have so many things, uh, cool things to talk about in React. So I will definitely do that as another separate session. Can access presentation content. Agilan is asking for presentation content. Yes, Agilan, sure. I will. Uh, this is just a website, so I will put out uh, this thing in my website, and I will give you the link. I will maybe ask uh, Ashley from the Mozilla community to uh, send out an email to all the participants, thanking them, and also giving them this uh, cool presentation that I have done. Right? Uh, and if you want to know about contributing to Mozilla, you should talk to these people, Mozilla community people. I, I don't know much. And I am also like uh, I would also like to know about all these things, like you know how to contribute to Mozilla. I think they had a session uh, recently in this past weeks about uh, contributing to Mozilla. Maybe you guys have missed it, but don't worry, they will be doing it again. You can get in touch with these people, Mozilla community folks, right? And let me uh, anything else. Explanation is very good, benefited a lot. Huh? Thank you so much, Purushottaman. 
did you have your own react blog specify if any react blogs um no i just follow courses um on udemy initially and then i follow a bunch of people on twitter so they keep sharing a lot of very useful information and dan abramo is writing a lot on uh, javascript and react etc he has been he has been doing that but now he has stopped i think but all his contents are available in his blog so you can just go and read it um okay all right mitra uh, okay people are saying thanks okay let me put put out my uh, id here i magesh my id is i magesh okay on uh, fb and uh, twitter you can find me on twitter and facebook if you look at uh, this thing as i magesh right i put it here <clears throat> in your broadcast message at i magesh is my id you can just follow me on twitter if you want to uh, you know stay tuned about the future updates my part 2 session is obviously coming out and i will be doing uh, you know part 3 where i cover the syntax you know es6 es7 es8 only syntax and only coding very restricted to coding and then we'll also move on to react so i want to do it step by step i'm putting together this full stack uh, course which has both you know front front end and back end so right now i have just i'm i'm working on the front end part so it works with react and javascript so for you to understand react really well uh, you need to know uh, javascript because javascript i mean react is basically using the vanilla javascript it react only has few methods that you need to know few concepts apart from that it is all powered by you know javascript just the amazing thing and here you have been posted about uh, these things right mozilla's uh, links here you can check it out uh, their web page their telegram group and then you know you can subscribe to the mailing list for uh, mozilla right um, they have instagram page facebook page yes mm-hmm. similarly we also have a facebook developer circle so uh, we have a facebook group for uh, facebook devsi chennai Uh, you can just go to that group and uh, follow those updates events that are being done uh, from the facebook community so in the coming days i want to like collaborate with other communities like mozilla and uh, you know few more and you know do such events to reach out to many people right so all right guys i think we are uh, the time is up i think we are done um, thank you so much for listening to me patiently for uh, for the last uh, two hours all right and um, you can reach out to me offline sorry not offline <laughs> i'm used to saying this always now it's like you know offline i'm not going to meet anybody uh, offline for some time so you're going to do this online just reach out to me on twitter or uh, facebook if you have any questions or if you need any anything right okay guys thank you so much um, we can close ashley are you there do you want to take over yeah. yes so it was really a great session and thanks for being such a interactive audience everyone we too enjoyed hosting the session and mahesh it was super awesome we learned a lot of things from basics to certain advanced con- concepts so yeah as mahesh said we will be coming up with part 2 session very soon and we will be reaching out to you with the post event email through your registered mail ids so expect our email within days once we upload this recorded session into youtube we'll reach out to you guys uh, with our post email in that we will be collecting your feedbacks as well as uh, what are your inputs for us for our next sessions so with all those input after working on all those inputs we will be back online for our part 2 and part 3 session as the plan goes so yeah i have already for few who have asked about uh, how to contribute to mozilla so as we are running short of time i'm not taking much of your time instead i have shared you the links through which you can join to mozilla tamil nadu uh, telegram group or you can reach out to our facebook instagram and twitter profiles you can go there look into it or you can even tweet us or message us in facebook and we will reply you with the necessary contents so that's all for the day guys it's it was really a great session thanks for being with us and the recordings will be available in our youtube uh, official youtube channel mozilla tn as well as in facebook uh, developer circle chennai official page before sunday and we will be back even with our post event email before sunday thank you and good night